Uh, my background is I'm a, a board certified pathologist with subspecialty boards in molecular genetic pathology and I did an additional fellowship in um, pathology, oncology, informatics. I focused my career on ushering massively parallel testing technologies from the research laboratory into the clinical laboratory. My, uh, my mentor when I was training uh, told me that I always live five years in the future. So you'll see a little bit of uh, forward looking evolution, predictive evolution if you will. There's my disclosure. I am the chief medical officer at 23andMe, which is a direct-to-consumer genetic testing company, but I will not be talking about any of our products or services today. Okay, in the next about 15 minutes or so, um, I'm just going to give you an overview of what I see as a paradigm shift in the way we practice medicine, and I'm going to describe it in terms of, of what's been called P4 medicine or what I call P5 medicine. Explain that to, first explain to you what that is. And then I'm going to um, kind of fold that in with the technology changes that Peter was referring to, in particular something called next generation sequencing. That chart that he showed you where the cost of sequencing a gene just plummets, that's, that's the space we're living in right now. And I'm gonna combine those two first bullets together to give you two examples of how this can impact the way you practice medicine. So uh, P4 medicine is the first four bullets, and I'll read it to you. Predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory. And then I added on philanthropic. And what this means is it's a paradigm shift. It's happening slowly over decades, but we're towards the end of this paradigm shift. So in the 1960s, 90% of oncologists didn't even tell their patients they had cancer, right? And they treated them with whatever poison might be available and hoped that it worked. Um, where today, what happens is, is a much more interactive relationship between a physician and their patients. Patients are much more educated because of the information age and the internet. Um, it used to be you had to go to med school to do a differential diagnosis. Now anybody can do their own differential diagnosis online and they're coming to their physicians um, ready to participate. And they're much more proactive about not wanting to get sick in the first place. The problem is most of our healthcare systems grew up not to be about health and wellness, but about treating diseases once they exist and the consumers don't want to get sick in the first place. And now we can start to use all kinds of information, genetics is just one, one type of information, to help us predict who might, who's at risk for getting sick in the first place, and then prevent them from getting sick. And then if they get sick anyway, we can go ahead and personalize the treatment, like Peter referred to, which is the right drug for the right person at the right time. All the while, the, the patient and physician relationship is changing and becoming one of, of much more communication and back and forth. And the other thing that we're seeing is that people want to not only participate in their own health care, but they want to participate in research. They want to help them not be sick anymore, as well as help other people not get sick like them. And so we're, we're starting to see routes where patients are able to get together in participatory research settings. Um, and the more we enable that, I think the, the more they'll do it. This comes around to the, the evolution and, and that dropping price point of, of looking at germline DNA. So, DNA. so there's a lot of things you can do with next-gen sequencing, and I'm just going to talk about looking at germline DNA. And in the 1990s, we started looking at DNA in clinical <coughs> laboratories and using it in, in a clinical setting. Um, but because of the technology, we would look at single mutations, one at a time. Um, and then we started expanding once we got to Sanger sequencing, we could do what we called at the time whole gene sequencing. It's, it's not really whole gene sequencing in today's concept of that, but to us it was good enough to call it that. But it was really laborious and really expensive, thousands of dollars to, to do a whole gene sequencing clinical test. And the turnaround time on those tests could take four months, six months, ten months. Um, and then the thing is, is that we knew that, that this disease that we think the patient might have could be caused by dozens of different genes. You know, and so you could systematically try to go one at a time to get through um, an X-linked mental retardation workup, which can, we know to be caused by about 90 genes. But you're never gonna make it out of cost and time, right? You make it a, a few genes in, in the best case scenario. And so these people would then just get kind of an unconfirmed diagnosis, the diagnostic odyssey kind of situation. With the advent of next-gen sequencing, genes are on their way to Genes are now very cheap, and they're on their way to becoming essentially free. It's pretty game-changing in how we begin to uh, work up our patients and our testing algorithms. So now it's, um, in the United States, actually, there's well over 100 um, disorder-specific targeted panels that are available through clinical laboratories. I've listed two of the examples up there, but there's obviously many more. Then, 
on the, you know, the laboratory side, um, the, in the pathology laboratory, it became obvious to us that it's actually much easier from a lab ops operations perspective if I just have one big assay and behind the scenes I'm running the Mendeleome, which are the 5,000 genes that we know to cause human diseases. And then no matter what you order from me, you, maybe you order an X-linked metal retardation from me, you don't know what test I'm running in the background. All you know is you're getting back the question that you asked. But from a cost effective point of view and economies of scale and laboratory management, it's much easier for laboratories to one, run one big assay. So now we've seen a movement towards um, these, these larger assays in the background, and we just deliver the information that you need when you need it. Um, once you're doing 5,000 genes, it actually becomes not that much more expensive to do 20,000 genes, which gets us to whole exome sequencing. And this has become pretty common, um, kind of standard in care in the United States anyway, for um, suspected genetic uh, disorders in children, and we'll, we'll test the trio, the child and the two parents. Um, and we're more and more, we're doing that earlier in the diagnostic workup rather than later, because the diagnostic yield is, is so high and it's just much more cost effective to do a whole exome first um, and then do other you know, point specific tests that are not amenable to an exome later. Um, whole genome sequencing, we all know it's coming. The, the only game in play now is just guessing when. Is it three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? But we all know it's coming. And once we get here, um, now we can start to retire uh, some of the older technologies like cytogenetics and cytogenomics. Because this technology, once you're looking at the whole genome, you can actually capture the information um, that you're getting in those older tests. And so you can do this one single comprehensive test, the caveat being that next generation sequencing does have blind spots. There are certain types of things it cannot see. An example of that would be um, trinucleotide repeat disorders. Um, Huntington's disease is an example of that, but there's, there's uh, you know, dozens of these or so. And so you have to be aware that there's still things that are going to be blind to next-gen sequencing. It's not appropriate for everything all the time, but it gets you a long ways there. Okay, so a couple of examples of how this could start to impact the way you practice medicine, even now or in the next few years, depending on your practice setting. Um, a a few years ago, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics put out this guideline around uh, reporting of incidental findings. And what this means is, so like an incidental finding is not new in medicine. When you order a chest x-ray for a rule out pneumonia, right, the radiologist is, is gonna look and gonna look to see if there's pneumonia, but what they're also gonna do is systematically go through that x-ray, look for broken bones or bone abnormalities, check the cardiac silhouette, check the lungs of the base, or bases of the lungs, sorry, and they'll tell you if they see any abnormalities so that you can do something about it, or if there's a great big tumor, they're gonna tell you so that you can do something about it. In genetics, we can now do that too. So the recommendation is, for the clinical laboratories, is if you're doing an exome or a whole genome, and you think the patient might have X-linked metal retardation, that's the primary workup. Go and you look for the 90 genes that could cause that phenotype, but then you also need to go look at these 56 genes to see if there's any pathogenic variants there and report those as well. And the reason these genes made the list is because they're um, adult onset disorders that have well-established preventative guidelines. So that if you knew that this child had it, and more importantly, the child's relatives are now at risk. So if you found a BRCA in the child, the more, you know, there's nothing to really be concerned about in the baby at this time. The, the preventative opportunity is now in these at-risk family members. You can look in the mothers and, and uh, fathers and um, aunts and uncles. And now you have an opportunity to prevent breast and ovarian cancer before it happens, where we didn't used to have that option. So that's the rationale behind this list of 56. So you got the hereditary cancer syndromes, the heredio cardiovascular syndromes, things like, um, these are the sudden cardiac death, the young people who drop dead on the, on the basketball court. Uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, which I'll show you is um, poorly underdiagnosed. Um, and we lose um, great opportunities for preventative care there. Um, some of the hereditary connective tissue disorders and aortopathies, and then adverse anesthesia reactions. So familial hypercholesterolemia is, um, is both common and devastating. You can see it compared to some of the other Mendelian genetic disorders that I just mentioned along the um, x-axis there. So it's very common. It's rarely diagnosed clinically, so we miss the opportunities. These people have a 20-fold increased risk of coronary heart disease, um, and it happens at a much, much younger age. The heterozygotes, the people who have one bad copy, are, are born with high cholesterol. 
and it's de several decades later before they even realize that they have high cholesterol, we lose decades of opportunity of preventative care. This is uh, my justification for why I claim that we're not very good at diagnosing uh, FH. Um, this is, you see the UK is actually much better than the United States. Less than 1% of FH gets diagnosed in the United States. Um, and I think it's just because high cholesterol is so common. Um, we see it every day, all the time. We get a little numb to it. Not everybody presents with those tendons and thomas that we learned about in our textbooks in medical school. Um, and we don't often take a real careful family history um, to, to try to pick up that there was a lot of young cardiac death in this family um, and therefore say, oh, this could be FH, and then uh, do the appropriate uh, genetic workup for that. Here is why you can't rely just on cholesterol levels alone in FH. It's the problem of overlap. You can't rely just on super high cholesterol to trigger you off that this might be a Mendelian disorder. This is in kids. This graph is in kids. When you look at the same graph when in, uh, at age 50, those graphs are almost sitting on top of one another. So just the LDL cholesterol level alone isn't going to tip you off. Um, and if we can figure out a way to incorporate the genetic testing into this, it, it, it can avoid uh, false negatives. The problem is that the testing for familial hypercholesterolemia has typically been in the United States about $4,000. So um, you had to test infrequently and judiciously. And, um, but now it, it's very affordable to do this. In, I could set up an assay in my laboratory to do this for you know, I don't know, 49 pounds. It's, it's on its way to free. It's on its way to a point. I've had my whole genome sequence and my whole exome sequence. I have it on my laptop. I can look to see right now if I have any pathogenic variants in FH. We're gonna get to a time soon when people like me are gonna be coming into your office and instead of, of you seeing that I have high cholesterol and wondering if you should look at my DNA, I'm gonna say, I've looked at my DNA, it says I have FH and you should check my cholesterol. The conversation is gonna switch. This is the, the workup in the UK from NICE. So it's at that, that provisional diagnosis, that clinical diagnosis is where you're catching that 12% based on you know, clinical suspicion. You then get triaged to a specialist in FH and that's where the genetic workups gets done. And then you do the cascade testing of family members if you can find the causative mutation in the proband. Um, and, and it's still in this model of judicious use under the assumption that this is extremely expensive. So we can change this paradigm in the next few years and it will be possible. Um, and this, the benefits of doing so is that we can identify at-risk people who are younger and initiate appropriate uh, treatment and uh, prevention, more active surveillance. Um, there are studies out there that have shown that people who, who have had their genetics done in the context of FH are more compliant with their treatment regimens. Um, and since genes are free, we can also go ahead, and because these people are most likely going to go on statins, we can go ahead and take a look and check your risk for statin-induced myopathy. One more example. I call this putting the patient back together with genetics. And again, this is just taking, kind of mixing and matching from that ACMG 56 genes and, and, a, and a few more that I've thrown in here. And say, okay, we've gotten so specialized in medicine and healthcare that we tend to, if you're a breast oncologist, you care only about breast and you care only about cancer in the breast. The person who is sick cares about their whole person. And genetics and genomics is a way for us to put this person back together and care about the whole situation. So a person who just got cancer, you're gonna to wanna to know, is this hereditary or is this sporadic? You're gonna to wanna to know if it's, in this case, BRCA, that's gonna guide surgical management. You might do a more extensive surgery. It's also gonna determine if you're um, eligible for PARP inhibitors. Um, it also, if it ends up being hereditary, it's gonna inform at-risk family member testing. But there's other things that are about to happen to this patient too. It's about to go get on chemotherapy, likely chemotherapy. Um, and what are, what are the other information I can pull out of your DNA that could be useful in a preventative context? Well, there's a chance I might give you a cardiotoxic drug. Um, we already evaluate people to try to reduce cardiotoxicity and evaluate their cardiac risk. This is one more piece of information that I can peel off at this moment in this patient's history to, re to, to inform that conversation about the potential for cardiotoxicity. I grayed out neurotoxicity and bone marrow because those are my hypotheses and they are not yet proven. Um, but I can imagine what genes I would look at. Um, we can give PGX's pharmacogenomics. So what, is your tumor gonna respond to the drug appropriately? 
Um, long QT syndrome is, a, is a, a cardiac arrhythmia that's exacerbated by about 300 different drugs and they're contraindicated in people in long QT. Uh, long QT is about one in 500 in the general population. A lot of people walking around that don't know that they have it. But even things like tamoxifen is, is contraindicated and a lot of other things you might give somebody on chemotherapy like the antifungals and the antibiotics. They're probably gonna go to surgery. When you go to a surgery, the anesthesiologist asks you before, have you or anybody in your family ever had an adverse reaction to anesthesia? Do you or anybody in your family have excessive bleeding with surgical procedures or tooth extractions, right? They're trying to look at your DNA and it was too expensive to look at your DNA before, so they talk to you about what your DNA might look like. Now we can actually combine those conversations together. Um, and well, and the third point, you know, people who are, who are sick and have family members who are sick, they want to do whatever they can to have this not happen to other, themselves or other people, and they will participate and share their, their exomes and genomes that have now been sequenced in the course of answering these questions. So in closing, um, oh, I actually removed my slides that support that lower bullet, in the end, but I have more stories like this. Um, the point is, is that the way we're practicing medicine is changing, our relationships with our patients are changing, and the, the advances in technology are, are, are making us able to better deliver onto these promises of P5 medicine.